next Sunday, of course, we are having the Gideons International here with us. People say, who's that? Those people that put Bibles in the hospitals to go to hell, right? They're going to be with us giving us a presentation, and then we'll have a pop-up mail after. Here's what I ask you to do. Ask you to do. We'll take up a, a, a love offer at the end. I'm asking that whatever you spend on lunch, consider giving to the Gideons. I think that a pocket New Testament is about $1.30, $1.35 a piece, and we're hoping uh, to take up enough offer to perhaps provide a thousand of those little pocket New Testaments. So that's what our plan is next Sunday, and we're looking forward to that. So be, please make sure that you're here with us and make plans uh, to attend, and we will be looking forward to it, okay? If you have your Bible this morning, and I hope you do, please open it to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We, of course, are continuing on in our current sermon series, The Greatest Story. Uh, this morning by looking at one of the most important pieces of instruction as it relates to prayer given to us by the most important person in the course of human history. That, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ. Who better to teach us to pray than Him? Amen? Amen. And so we have that instruction here before us. This guidance that He gives to His disciples. And thankfully... God in His infinite wisdom saw fit to record that instruction and include it in the canon. And we have it now in our Bible that we can learn from. And boy, there is so much to learn from the Lord's Prayer. I read once this. The Lord's Prayer brings the whole of life into the presence of God and brings the whole of God into the presence of life. Now let's think about that for a moment because that really is what prayer is, right? Prayer gets us into God's presence and it invites Him into our life. That's exactly what we talk about when we mean prayer, this form of open communication. That's why prayer and this model of prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us is so vitally and very important. And so let's pick it up here in Matthew chapter 6. Start with me in verse 5. And we'll read uh, through about verse 13 or 14, I believe. But let's look at what the Lord Jesus says here as it relates to prayer. <clears throat> Jesus says this. He says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the who? The hypocrites. the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by who? Amen. Amen. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the who do? The heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also do what? Amen. Forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we begin our sermon today. Pray like this. Father in heaven, it's a joy and an honor to be able to gather around your word this morning where we find ourselves in our current sermon series here in Matthew 6. We learn, Lord, and see and read that you are teaching your disciples how to pray. And God, I pray that you'll also teach us how to pray. Teach us, God, to pray more effectively. Preach us, God, to reach into the places, the depths of our soul where we so... Uh, need help in so many different areas of life and 
Help us, God, to be willing to go into that secret place and put these things on the table for you to hear, God. And as we pray, draw us closer unto Thee. Help us, Father, to the very best of our ability to mimic Your precious Son in the way He prayed. Help us, Lord, to remember that prayer is not at all about us. It's all about You. Lord, I pray that Your Holy Spirit will illuminate Scripture today. I pray, God, that He will help us to see not only the necessity for prayer, but how it is so vitally important that we remember who it is we're praying to and the reason for why we're praying. Lord, we welcome you into the presence of our congregation this morning and into your word. We do, God, ask, beg, plead for your help. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I first learned the Lord's Prayer in the early 90s on the football field at Southwest Middle School. It's interesting. We would go through the whole practice. We would tackle and hit one another and be mean and the coaches would encourage us. <laughs> yell and scream and sometimes say bad words and all of these things give us some of that encouragement. And after they got through chewing us out and telling us how terrible we were, and they were usually right, they called a whole group of guys together and we join hands and say the Lord's Prayer. We end on a good note at least. And so I remember growing up hearing the Lord's Prayer, but really that was when it was put into practice. They would cuss you for every breath, but then if you mess up on the Lord's Prayer, you got to run another lap. <laughs> and so that's where we learned it. The Lord's Prayer is not an uncommon thing. Sports teams still do it today. We see this happening. But here is what I love most about the Lord's Prayer. And here's why we're stopping here this morning in this uh, current sermon series. I love the Lord's Prayer because I love how quickly Jesus gets to the point. He gets right into the heart of the matter. He, he didn't dilly-dally with, with flowery language or poetic parades. You've heard people pray like that. Instead, He packs a ton of theological Good common sense into about 70 words. Uh, to put that into context, in a 30-minute sermon, that's about 3,000 words, depending on how fast or how slow we talk. Now, you've heard Jody Yacht preach. He's about 6,000 words in 30 minutes. <laughs> because when that brother starts, he plows through and he doesn't stop. But in a 30-minute sermon, we, it's about 3,000 words. We can say about 10, 000, about 1,000 words every uh, 10 minutes. But here's the deal. Jesus said more in these 70 words than any preacher will ever say in 3,000 words. It's just packed full of goodness, richness, teaching us how it is that we should communicate with our Heavenly Father. And sure, it's quite unusual to what we're used to and what we've seen. Now, the Jews had plenty of good quality prayers. And not only did they have good quality prayers, they had a very strict regiment of prayer, okay? They prayed at the third hour. They prayed at the sixth hour. They prayed at the ninth hour of every day. If praying was about quantity and not quality, the Jews had it, brother. They did it, did it often. It was scheduled for them. It was at the center of their day. One of those prayers was called the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's this famous daily prayer that they would recite at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. It goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. We've heard that over and over. This is one of those common prayers that the Jews would learn. And they would say at the beginning of their day and at the end of the day. And that's a, a good one to memorize and pray, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How can you go wrong there? So the Jews, the people, were covered with prayers. They, they, they prayed a bunch every day. And to be sure, in their heads, the disciples whom Jesus had called knew a lot of these prayers. 
I could start with God is good and you would say because we learned it. We know that prayer. To be sure, the disciples had done the same. They had been taught the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 and other prayers throughout their life. They, they knew from an early age and in their home life, they knew what to pray, but they wanted to know how to pray. And there really is a difference, isn't there? So they began to ask Jesus about how to pray. And Jesus was willing to teach here. Why? Because, well, perhaps there were some things of the Jewish prayer life that he was maybe just a little concerned about. He knew people's hearts, amen? He knew what they were feeling. He knew what they were thinking and what they were experiencing. He knew that there was this tendency to want to let everyone know what they were doing, this, this outward show of piety. Jesus knew this. And instead of prayer being this, this intimate conversation between the, the Jew and their God, it, it was instead lengthy. And there was a lot of wordiness to some of these prayers. And Jesus says it's not the words and being seen that are important. I can sort of hear him in my mind's eye. And thankfully Matthew picked it up for us a bit. I can sort of hear Jesus in my mind's eye and see him having this conversation saying, Cut out all the babbling. Don't do those things. It's the heart and the soul that matters when we pray. It's the heart and, and the soul behind the prayer that matters the most. He probably would agree with me when I say that some of the best prayers are the shortest prayers. Amen? Especially if it's lunchtime. Come on. <laughs> but some of the best prayers are short and deliberate prayers. There's a, a time in preacher Dwight L. Moody's life. We talked about him. You know about him. Moody Institute. There's a time in Dwight L. Moody's life when the, this article I read said that he had just been the recipient of all of these blessings. They were overflowing. All of these blessings from the Lord had been coming in. And the article said that in his abundance, he was suddenly seized with the realization that his heavenly Father was showering him almost more than he could take on. And encouraged and overwhelmed, Dwight L. Moody paused to pray after an immense season of blessing. He paused and prayed and said with great volume, Stop, God! It's more than I can bear. Now that is sort of a spontaneous prayer. Probably not a very common one at this day and time. But it's a beautiful transition from eternal, almighty, gracious Father of all good things, thy hand hath abundantly and gloriously supplied our deepest needs. How blessed and thankful we are to come to the end to declare unto thee and on and on and on grinding into Snore City. Dwight M. Moody said, stop. It's more than I can bear. Chuck Swindoll told that story in his church years ago, and after the service, he said that a fellow came up to him and said, I've got another one for God. Start. He might stop with Mr. Moody, but I'd like him to start with me. Listen to this famous Jewish prayer, trying to get God's attention. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Boy, they covered all the bases there, didn't they? But how do we know that we're using the right words? Because certainly there are times in life when our heart does cry out those things, and we want to remind God that He is extolled and honored and all of those key things. How do we know we're using the right form of words. And more importantly, how do we know that God is listening? Why would God even bother to listen to us? Who am I that I would get God Almighty's attention? Mm -hmm. Then, how do we know that He'll answer my prayer? One of the reasons that the Jews, and the pagans for that matter, tried to cover all of the bases in the way they addressed their gods was there was a very real fear 
First, that the God they were praying to might not be listening. And second, that they might be angry with the one that's doing the praying. So they had to say all of the, the right words and, and, and shouts and dances and, and prophesy and prophecies and all these things. They had to do something to be sure in their minds that they were doing this right. Otherwise, the guys might be angry with them and refuse their request or even punish them. I can't help but to think about uh, Elijah there on Mount Carmel. If there are some things that I hope God allows us to go, I'm thinking there's a theater up there. And he's like, hey, y'all want to see something? Watch this. And then he shows us Elijah on Mount Carm Carmel dealing with all of Baal's prophets, 450 of them. <laughs> Elijah says, okay, y'all start praying. And I can sort of see Elijah getting in a chair. Kind of kick it back. Y'all go first. <laughs> and these people start acting crazy. They're dancing around and cutting themselves and hooting and hollering. And Elijah still kicked back. Maybe he's sleeping. Pray louder. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's gone to the restroom. Elijah knew all along these people were nuts. But they did those things trying to get the attention of their God. Trying to make sure that, that God was listening and when He responded, He would respond favorably. I wonder though if some of that fear is still with us today. Even in the way we pray, do we still have worries about prayer that we're not doing it right or that God might not hear us or uh, that He's angry with us or worse, that He simply won't answer, and then how do we as believers address those concerns and fears? <clears throat> Jesus gives us the model of prayer. It depends on our understanding of the God we're praying to, Jehovah God. And so Jesus answered, He says, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. Isn't that marvelous? And Jesus is there saying, don't worry. God knows what you need even before you ask. And there's no need for all that babbling and all that shouting and all that acting crazy. And then he begins to tell them how to do it. It's one thing to tell somebody to do something. It's another to show them. Amen. Think about Buddy North. Ends up at the top of big stuff working on power lines. Now, if I report to Buddy, I want Buddy to show me how to connect those things. Not just say, get up there and connect them. I want some guidance, amen? amen. And so Jesus says, this is how you pray. Don't, he didn't say, just don't, just, just pray. He says, here's how you do it. So he says, our Father in heaven, it's a recognition, right, of who our Father is. Now, if you had a good Father growing up, then this helps. It makes sense to us. But if you had a lousy father growing up, this might be tough for you. We think about the relational aspect of God and, and fatherhood. It's what it's all about. It's about a relationship. And in this case, when we pray to God, our Father in heaven, it's about a relationship between God and you. It's based on the love of a father for his child, and it's based upon the love and security of that child in their father. And so we say our Father in heaven. I heard about a man one time. He was on an airplane. You guys ever been on a really rough flight? Not a lot of fun. So this man was on a really rough flight. The plane was going through turbulence. It was bouncing up and down, going back and forth. To make matters worse, there was a huge thunderstorm that the plane couldn't fly over or around but had to fly through. If you've ever flown through a thunderstorm, you will get saved. Because <laughs> you will pray, brother, like you have never prayed before. And so they're going through this thunderstorm, and the thunder is clapping, and the lightning is just lighting the cabin up. Everyone is fearful, and they're holding on, except the man is sitting beside this little girl who is at perfect peace. She's reading her little book. There's a smile on her face. Everybody all around her is scared to death. Finally, they get through the storm and they land the plane. 
that's a problem with a lot of uh, preachers today. We preach on and on and on. We don't land the plane. We just keep going. <laughs> they land the plane. They get there on the tarmac and get, get it stopped. And the man looks over at the little girl. He says, you are so brave. Were you not scared throughout that flight? There was lightning. There was thunder and all of these different things. She said, no, sir, I'm not scared of that. He said, why? She said, my dad is the pilot. <laughs> now think about that as it relates to prayer. If Father God, the one we pray to, is the pilot of our life, what are we fearful of? Amen. And so Jesus says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is simply recognizing who he is, it's hallowing his name recognizing who is in charge of this thing called life. And that's important because you remember the, the, the scribe comes up to Jesus and he says, what is the greatest commandment? And it's in Mark 12. What we forget is that there were only 613 commandments. Now preachers exaggerate and embellish. That's the truth. There were 613 at least and some more. And so the scribe comes to Jesus trying to trick him and he says, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus sort of seems to have taken that question as meaning, can you sum up the Torah, the, the law of God, all in one sentence? And he does. He takes the familiar, which is the Shema prayer, and he transforms it by the addition of a few words and he makes it immediately understandable to the scribe. You find it in Mark 12, verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your what? We talked about that a few minutes ago. That's one of the prayers that the Jews would say morning and night. Jesus had learned that. Jesus says this is the first commandment. And the second, like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. There you go. That's what Jesus says. What the whole law is about, loving God, loving others, all of these other laws are merely clarifications on the two most important laws. Sometimes it's called the Jesus Creed. The two most important laws, love God and love others. It makes sense, doesn't it? what life is about. And you can't have one without the other. You can't love others effectively without loving God. And don't say you love God if you won't love others. Another familiar Jewish prayer called the Kaddish. The opening words seem strangely familiar. Glorified and hallowed be God's great name throughout the world which He has created according to His will. May He establish His kingdom in your lifetime and during your days and within the life of the entire house of Israel speedily and soon. And say amen. That sounds a lot like the Lord's Prayer, right? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus here does the same thing as He did with the law. He's taking the familiar and He's transforming it as He's teaching His disciples to pray. He takes a prayer that His disciples would have been familiar with. He adds the Jesus Creed, which is loving God and loving others, so that it becomes the prayer uh, that would be passed down from generation to generation and end up on a football field in eastern North Carolina at some point. <laughs> The prayer that summed up what all other prayers should be about. It's the model prayer. And the interesting thing about the Lord's Prayer is it's not about me or my needs. A lot of times that's what we think prayer is. Like driving through a McDonald's drive through God, I'll take a number one with an apple pie. That'd be good. And a number two. And that's not at all how prayer works. In fact, prayer is not at all about my needs. It is about God and His relationship with us. Love God and love others. Give us this day, our daily bread. Not about me or my needs, but about what God determines I need. God, You give me my daily bread. You give me what You think is most important. He says, forgive us our sins. Again, that's not about me. That's about God forgiving me of my failures. 
as we have forgiven, he says, lead us not into temptation. Not about me giving into the flesh. It's about God keeping me from temptation. And if he sees fit for me to walk into it, he delivers me from it. One author wrote this. The Lord's Prayer is a yearning for God's will to be done. It's about His name being hallowed, lifted up, and loved. And it's a desire for all of us to benefit from the generous love of God for our comfort, healing, and spiritual well-being. And so Jesus has this conversation with His disciples and He teaches them how to pray. All right, that's my introduction. I'm not kidding. You will not be the Methodist of the gold crowd today. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer connects us with the wholeness of God in three ways. Again, Jesus says pray like this. First, the Lord's Prayer connects us with the spiritual realm of God. The spiritual realm of God. We live in this scientific age that demands proof before belief can happen. Amen? Right? It's physical proof. If that can't happen, then I don't believe it. In other words, seeing really is believing. Yet as believers, we know that there is more to life than just the physical. It's not something that we can just prove empirically. It's a faith thing. That's why one commentator calls the Lord's Prayer the disciple's prayer because the Lord's Prayer can only be spoken by someone who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's why the Lord's Prayer doesn't make sense to an unbeliever or to an outsider. It's said in faith. Jesus says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are acknowledging that there is this spiritual realm in which God exists. And the spiritual connects us with the physical realm. He says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's important, right? The best way of understanding your kingdom come is in the context of the Hebrew writing style called parallelism. It's all, throughout the Psalms. Let me give you a couple of examples. A verse divides into two where the second half repeats and amplifies the first half. For example, Psalm 46, 1. You'll recognize this verse. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Okay? The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. I shall not want. The second half of the verse brings out the meaning of the first half of the verse. If we apply that same concept to the Lord's Prayer, then it says, your kingdom come, then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's the second half that explains and amplifies the first half, and then we have a definition of the kingdom of God. In other words, God's kingdom is wherever on earth God's will is being done. Sometimes we get in this mindset, this thought process that the kingdom of God only exists up there somewhere in heaven. That's not true. If you're doing the will of God, you are loving and serving Him with all of your heart, then the kingdom of God is right where you are. People say all the time, I, I work in a terrible place. It's not a Christian workplace. If you're a Christian and you work there, it's a Christian workplace. Talk about God's will. I read recently that home is where we are when we are in the center of God's will. To be in the kingdom, to be in God's kingdom, when we pray that part of the prayer, is to submit to and obey God's will. It's not about nations, it's about people. It's about you and I. It's about submission of my will and my life and my heart to God. That's why God's kingdom can uh, span the past it can be right here in the present, and it can look forward to the future. Anyone at any time in history who has submitted their lives to God's will was living presently in God's kingdom. And Jesus says, so your kingdom come. In other words, may we find ourselves in the center of God's will. That's what he's telling his disciples. First half of the prayer puts God at the center. And having done that, we can turn to ourselves and others. Again, love God and love, love others. That's the Jesus creed. So the first part there, we are connected to the spiritual realm. The second part that the Lord's Prayer does is it connects us to the physical realm. How big is God? We know He's the creator of the universe. We know He's the sustainer of everything. We know that it's the Spirit of God that we read about in the book of Genesis hovering over the waters right at the beginning 
of the beginning of everything, God is that big, creator God, yet He is interested in every minute detail of my life. Give us this, our daily bread. Lord, give me what I need today. Give me exactly what I need. At the heart of our material needs is the food we eat and the thought behind the phrase is that God is concerned enough with our daily physical needs. And to this great big God, we can bring our little bitty selves and problems to Him in the light of all that is going on in the world. You think about all of the millions and millions and millions of prayers that go out every single day, yet God hears me when I say, God, I am hurting I am struggling. Sure, this, this may seem like a small thing to others, but there is no small thing to God. If you're praying, it, it's a big thing. If it's a big thing to Him, it's a big thing to you, and vice versa. And Jesus reminds us, when He talks about giving us our daily bread, the Lord's Prayer connects us to the physical realm of God, and then thirdly, the Lord's Prayer connects us to the relational realm. That's what Jesus means when He talks about forgiving our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? This is where the prayer touches not only our relationship with God, but also our relationship with others. Again, the Jesus Creed is to love God and love others. And at a personal level, that can hurt, right? Because there are times when we have falling outs with one another. And Jesus knew this because he adds this rider to the prayer he's teaching his disciples in verse 14. Remember what he said? If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also do what? He'll forgive you. But if you aren't willing to forgive men of their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Well, that's, that's touching. That's deep. You say, in other words, for me to receive the forgiveness of God, I need to be willing to forgive others. Uh, you better believe it. And that's hard, isn't it? Why? Because people are mean. <laughs> people are cunning. People are deceptive. People do things to hurt one another. It happens every day. It's happened in your life. It will continue to happen, and it will happen in the future. Had a conversation, I think, with Asher and Ryan. They were picking on each other. I can't even remember how it went. One of them said, I've already forgiven him for that. I'm not doing it again. And I said, Well, the Bible says 70 times 7. That's when they always say, Okay, preacher, whatever. <laughs> Best thing is like, when they get in trouble and they're like, Dad, please don't preach to me. <laughs> you have your Bible in front of you, and I hope you do. Please. <laughs> but we forgive one another. That's what he commands us to do. Is there anything more relational than forgiveness? Not that we forget. We don't, but we forgive. It's those things that people say and do that really wind us up. And it's so hard. In one sense, Jesus' words seem severe. If we're not prepared to forgive even the minor offense, then we can't possibly expect that same forgiveness from God. Could it be that what Jesus is getting into is something like this? The love that pours into our lives from God is intended to flow out to others. We don't get to just hold on to it. But here's the deal. When we have unforgiveness in our heart, it's like putting a cork in a bottle so that nothing gets in and nothing gets out. Jesus is saying, don't, don't plug that thing up. You're willing to accept the love of Christ, to be willing to give the love of Christ, and you do that through forgiveness. Jesus ends the prayer this way. He says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, why is that important? Because he had just been tempted, hadn't been long before. He'd been taken into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and had been tempted. And he teaches us to beg God not to lead us there. But if He does, then to deliver us. Jesus knows what it's like. He, he knows what it's like to be tempted and tried, and He knows how desperate we need God's help to be delivered of it. He says, yearn for it. Ask for God's help when it comes to temptation. Then He ends that prayer by reminding us of the sovereignty of God. 
This is probably my favorite line of the whole prayer. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Whose? His. When you really think about that, it sort of takes a load off, doesn't it? That it's in His hands. The temptation in life is to constantly worry and be fearful of what may be or what may not be. But whenever we say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, we are saying, God, all of this is in your hands to do exactly what you see fit with. And I may not like it, but I'll accept it because of who you are and how great you are. And that's tough. That's hard sometimes when we're going through unimaginable circumstances. And so Jesus gives us my love. He explains it to his disciples. I like what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said, Prayer has become as essential to me as the heaving of my lungs and the beating of my pulse. What happens whenever our lungs stop breathing and our heart stops beating? We die. What happens when we stop praying? Spiritually, we begin to die. The challenge to us this morning is just that. Has prayer become as essential to you as the breath in your lungs and the beating of your heart? I heard of a fellow one time who had wandered away from the Lord. The problem was, and I believe it was the Lord's doing, he found himself in the middle of a huge lake on a boat with no paddle and an engine that wouldn't run. It seemed like a problem, amen? No phone, no help. No, nothing. Just him and a boat that won't move out in the middle of this lake. And so as the day goes on, he fiddles with the motor. He tries to do all of these different things, trying to figure out how he'll get back to shore. Maybe at some point someone will realize he's missing and come looking. But the bottom line was he was going nowhere fast. So as a last resort, he began to pray. <laughs> Lord, I know you haven't heard from me in a long time, but I am in a real bind here. Would you please send someone to help me get the motor started or send help or something? And if you do, I'll leave you alone until the next time I'm in a bind. <laughs> Boy, there's a lot of truth to that, though. We only talk with the Lord when we're in a real bind, but if we stay in constant communication with the Lord, then when the real tough situations come along, we will be ready. One author wrote this, Prayer is not a substitute for working, thinking, watching, suffering, or giving. Prayer is a support for all other efforts. It's the backbone of all we do. It's the backbone of our ministries and of our lives. Speaking of prayer, I'm going to have a special prayer this morning. Sister Kate Queen, if you'll come. You all, uh, most of you know Kay. I had the opportunity of meeting her this morning. Let's see right here. I have found a spot on her brain and she will have to test the most very serious situation. Mm -hmm. And so it asked if we would anoint her in prayer. Yes. The good word teaches us we can do. We call our elders forward, so deacons. Current deacons, past deacons, if you are ordained as a deacon, come on up. Let's go. concerned, worried, uh, uh, the various emotions that she's experiencing as they have found uh, what appears to be a cancerous spot on her brain. 
Lord, we can't always see or understand what your plan is for people's lives, but we rest in the fact and know that you are absolutely in control, that you are sovereign, that you have a plan for this, and that uh, you will have your will and your way going. We do pray, Lord, that when the test results return, perhaps the news won't be as bad as it was first expected. We pray, God, that you will heal her of this cancer, be it your will in this life, and, Lord, that you will provide peace and comfort and rest. Lord, I pray that you will ease any anxiety that, uh, that is present, that you will calm any fears, and that God, she will just, as uh, the prayer has mentioned, that we would all, for that fact, place our trust in you. Lord, for you are sovereign. You know all. You are the pilot of our life that we fully believe in and rest in faith in you for whatever uh, your will may be for us. Lord, to make it clear, we're asking for physical healing for this sister in this life. We're asking that you would grant that according uh, to your own will. Lord, we love you. Thank you for these men that have come and prayed. I thank you for this dear, sweet sister, and I pray your blessings upon her as she goes through this uh, this new adventure. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I'd ask that you would stand in your feet this morning. And if you would just want to end the invitation of God dealing with your heart this morning and you want to come and do exactly what we talked about today, pray. You can do so by coming to the altar. Of course, you can do so right where you are sitting, however you see fit. But the altar is certainly open. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come together into your house, which is a house of worship, a house of fellowship, a house of learning from your word. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us in bringing us together, teaching us through your messenger today. And we ask that you might always be praised and honored by us and that we might live lives that would bring glory to you and touch the lives of others as we reach out to share your love and your forgiveness with him. And now, Father, as we dismiss, hear us as we as a congregation pray the prayer which your Son Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught us to pray. Congregation, join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 